This brakes are great. They're really powerful. They've got brilliant modulation, but they can get ruined if you make the following common mistakes. But don't worry, we're going to show you how to avoid them so that you can save time, money, and stress. First up, just greasy grease and aerosol overspray residue on your rotors and pads. You need to be careful not to get this stuff on there because it will contaminate your rotors and pads. Now, if you spray aerosols willy-nilly all over the place within the proximity of your pads, you get on there, contaminate them, and then they will howl and scream like a banshee. It's not just noise. If you contaminate your braking surfaces with aerosols that contain lubricants, waxes, or polishes, you'll actually stop the brakes working properly, which could be dangerous. Be careful when cleaning your bike, but if you do get a bit of overspray and things on your braking surfaces that you shouldn't, don't worry, just make sure you clean it off with a product that is designed for cleaning brakes, such as this brake and drivetrain cleaner. There are several different ones out there. This is best done with the wheel removed as you can just gain much more access to both sides of the rotor and you can wipe them down clean with a microfiber. Just be sure that when you do wipe them with a microfiber, you're using one that is a clean microfiber and not one that has been sitting as a rag in your workshop for a while and is just covered in oily grease that's then going to contaminate the rotor further. As for the brake pads, you can give them a quick clean by flossing a microfiber with some brake cleaner on it through the caliper. But again, you can get a more effective clean if you actually just remove them and clean them separately. If they've been heavily contaminated or if they've glassed over because they've got too hot, one of the things you can do is actually just take a bit of sandpaper and rub down the surface of the brake pad compound just to take that contamination off the top and bring them back to life. The other thing to be aware of with your rotors is that the oils that occur in your skin will contaminate the rotor too. So make sure that you don't touch your rotors with bare hands. Be careful when putting your bike in the back of a car. Now, there's a couple of different things that can go wrong here. The first is that you can knock your rotors, which bends them slightly, which means that once you put them inside uh, the bike and they're running through the caliper, they'll rub and you'll get that annoying tick, 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 tick sound as you're riding along, which is the most annoying thing in the world. If your rotors do get knocked and then bend, you can bend them back, but it's a case of prevention is better than the cure. And once a rotor's been bent and you bend it back, you, you can never quite get it perfect as it was when it was new. Uh, to bend a rotor back, you can just use a adjustable spanner such as this, or a park tool have a specific tool to do the job too. One of these, a DT2, just goes on there. So when you put the wheel in the car, I would always suggest putting it this way up with the rotor upwards rather than resting on the rotor as that's putting weight on it and could bend it. And when your wheel is in the car, make sure that, well, ideally you don't want anything resting on the rotor. So don't put your wheel in the car and then think, oh, I'm gonna now put my rucksack on top of it because again, that could cause it to bend. If you're going on a particularly long journey or you're struggling for space in the car and you're gonna to need to pile some things on, then you can always remove the rotors and put them on at the other end. Whenever you remove your wheels, whether it's to put the bike in a car or in any other context, you need to be careful as well not to depress the brake levers because this will cause the pads to close and they'll be shut so that either, depending on how much you've pressed them, you can't actually then reinsert your wheel or your brakes just rub because the pads make in contact with the rotor once you put it back in. Now, you can easily fix this by either using uh, some chocks like this that you can get, which simply just go in between the brake pads and keep them apart, even if the brake lever is depressed for when your bike's in transit. Or if you don't use those and your brake pads do come close together, you can separate them again by using a tool such as this from Park. If you don't have one of these, they're really good. It also works quite well as a pizza cutter, although that would contaminate your pads if you used it immediately after. Um, you can use something like a tire lever or something plastic in there and avoid using something metal and especially not something sharp. So sometimes I've seen people use flathead screwdrivers in there. Don't do that because it can gouge your brake pads and damage them. <laughs> 
riding with dragging pads. Now, despite the constant sound of pads dragging being even more irritating than fingernails down a blackboard, there are still some psychopaths out there who seem to persist and ride all the time with their pads dragging. Now, there are a few different causes of this, some of which, uh, when the rotor's bent or the, or the pads have been closed, as we discussed when you put your bike in a car. But another common cause is when you've just changed your brake pads. And that's because new brake pads aren't worn down and they have much more braking compound material on the pad. And one of the big advantages with disc brakes, hydraulic disc brakes, is that they self-adjust over time. So as the pad wears, the pistons gradually move in closer to the rotor. This ensures that your braking is consistent no matter how much your pads and rotors have worn. The downside is that if you've got really, really worn pads like these, and then you swap them for some newer pads that have got a lot more compound than like this, your pistons need to be reset. So to do that, you can just use a piston reset tool such as this, which slides into the caliper and pushes the pistons apart and resets them to their original position. Or you can just use something plastic again, like a tire lever. using the wrong fluid. I'm surprised at how many people make this mistake, but it's important to use the exact right fluid for your brakes and understand that they're often not cross compatible. So for example, Megura uses a blue mineral oil, SRAM uses DOT fluid, and Shimano uses a red mineral oil. These aren't compatible and whatever brakes you're running, you should use the specific fluid. Don't use baby oil, don't use olive oil, sesame seed oil, rapeseed, like all this stuff. It's like, I, I, I'm saying that, you might think it sounds ridiculous. People do actually use these things. Now, of course, if you are on the run from a high security military prison where you were falsely incarcerated for a crime that you didn't commit and you require the use of bikes to help a small local community who are being strong armed by local thugs and your 1986 GMC custom van is out of action and you're in a pinch, then in that particular case, I'm giving you permission to use baby oil in your disc brakes instead of mineral oil because it does work. There's videos on the internet that show that it does, but it doesn't work anywhere near as well and it's not safe. So only in extreme circumstances. Make sure you check for wear and replace things when they are worn. I'm surprised at how many people don't know when their disc rotors are too worn. Pads are pretty easy because you can just visually inspect them and see when they've run out of compound or when they're close to running out of compound. Rotors are a little bit more tricky um, and you're gonna need to use a caliper, ideally like a digital vernier one like this. Most people don't have these at home, but your local bike shop will have one and I'm sure that they'll be very happy to just check them for you because if they are too narrow, then they've instantly probably made a sale. So just pop over to your local bike shop and when you're passing next, I'm sure they'll measure them for you for free. Um, incidentally, if you're running Shimano rotors, they start at 1.8 mil, and then once they get to less than 1.5, they need replacing. Mine are 1.79. Next is putting the wrong size rotors on when the calipers are set up for something different. So the bad thing about this is that it means that your brakes can often still work. So it can make you forget that you've done it. And I've seen people do this. So the classic example is when your calipers are set at 160 mil rotors, but you then put 140 mil rotors on your wheels and run them. The result is that only half of the brake pad is making contact with half of the braking surface on the disc it will still stop you, but your brakes are dramatically less efficient and it will ruin your pads and ruin your discs. Here's a picture of some pads where someone has done this. No, 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 no! Oh, and if you're wondering whose brake pads these are, the GCN presenter responsible has asked that they remain anonymous. So I'll let you speculate in the comment section down below as to who it was. Dragging your brakes. If you can learn to brake properly, your brakes, your pads, your rotors, they will last longer. This is because braking is all about heat dissipation or 
increasing entropy if you're a nerd. Now, if you drag your brakes all the way down a long descent, like we got Hank to do in our disc brake destruction video, then it builds up loads and loads of heat, which will cause the brakes to wear out more quickly. If you learn to brake properly, whereby you're braking into a corner and then out of a corner, you're releasing your brake and then just braking at the next brake point, you're giving your brakes a chance to dissipate a lot of heat in a short space of time, which they're designed to do and can do. And as a result, your brakes will work better, they will last longer and well, you'll just be a better descender. Well, there you have it. I hope you found these tips useful. If you need a guide on how to bleed and maintain your disc brakes, well, it's one of the step-by-step -step guides that we have in the Essential GCN maintenance book that's available in shop.globalcyclingnetwork. So make sure you check that out if that's what you're after. I hope you found this useful and I'll see you in the next one. Let us know in the comments as well um, what your tips are for not destroying disc brakes. And um, right, I'm gonna go now. Love you, bye.